going to start off today talking about our new report that we released yesterday. And the subject for our session is understanding the data, doing a report overview, and a BRICS comparison. Talking about these other dynamic economies and how the data we have on Brazil relates to those. And we have uh, Mr. Raymond Baker, who will talk about our report and talk about some of the data we have on the other BRICS countries. And we have uh, Paulo um, Robel, working on my Portuguese pronunciation, it's getting there, uh, from the BRICS Policy Center, who will talk about some of the trends and dynamics that they see in the other countries. And unfortunately, due to uh, something with, a, with another project that required him to be away this morning, uh, Rogerio Sobrero will not be here until the afternoon. Uh, our GFI's communications director, Clark Gascoigne, will moderate our session this morning to get us started. He previously served as the director of new media for GFI and the Task Force on Financial Integrity and Economic Development. And his previous experience was with the College Democrats of America, where he served as the national communications director. And he also worked around the Obama campaign with coordinating youth communications during that period. And he was a founding member of that group's new media effort at that period in time. He has been published in numerous publications, including the Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, The Hill, which is a congressional newspaper in, in Washington, as well as numerous TV channels. He has a degree in government and legal studies from Bowdoin College in the United States. So I will let Clark introduce our two speakers, and we will spend about half of this panel with the presentations, and Clark will start out with some questions for the panelists, and then we will open it up for a substantial period of questions with all of you. And so we look forward to uh, the issues and questions that you raise for the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Um, Raymond Baker doesn't need an introduction. He's already been introduced. Um, as you all know, he is the president of Global Financial Integrity, and he will be giving an overview of our new report on Brazil, capital flight, illicit flows, and macroeconomic crises. But I do want to introduce uh, Dr. Paulo Robel, who is a professor of international relations at PUC Rio and IRI researcher and coordinator of interinstitutional relations of the BRICS Policy Center. His lines of research in BPC include the perception of the central countries of the BRICS and the viability of the energy cooperation between the member countries of the BRICS. Professor Robel works in the field of international relations as a teacher, researcher, consultant, and administrator for over 20 years. Uh, besides the IRI, PUC, Rio, and BPC, Professor Robel works and worked at Estacio de Sa University, uh, Faculta Faculdades Candidato Mendes, pardon my, uh, my Portuguese, uh, IBMEC, uh, the Getulio Vargas Foundation, Department of War Studies, King's College London, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, which is uh, commonly known as Chatham House, um, the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research in Geneva, the Institute of Strategic and International Studies in Lisbon, the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington, D.C., and the Embassy of Brazil in London, as well as in the private sector in the uh, energy industry. Professor uh, Robel published a book by the United Nations in New York and wrote numerous book chapters and articles for academic publications in Brazil, Portugal, France, Mexico, Chile, Italy, Norway, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Um, so, but before we hear from Professor Robel, uh, we're going to hear a introduction of uh, GFI's report by uh, Raymond Baker. Uh, Jean, in the back, if you could switch PowerPoints to uh, to the other PowerPoint that's open on that computer. Uh, yes, to the the BRICS PowerPoint and findings of the report. That would be great. All right. Now, without further ado, I introducing Raymond Baker. Let me begin this session by giving you some further explanation of how we compile the data uh, that we utilize. 
I've told you that we, uh, we use World Bank and IMF data. The data that we use um, gives us an opportunity to analyze differences in balance of payment statistics and differences in trade statistics. What does that mean? Balance of payments, we're looking at government reports of inflows and outflows of government revenues and where there is a difference between inflows and outflows, those, that difference is identified as errors and omissions. Um, I, we interpret those errors and omissions as being unrecorded money that has disappeared out of or into uh, the country. That's part of our analysis. The second part of our analysis is using trade data filed with the IMF. Um, all countries file, most countries, almost all countries, file data with the IMF of their imports from and exports to every other country that they trade with. So this bilateral trade data is available uh, uh, in what's called direction of trade statistics. Now, if Brazil reports that it exports, um, uh, let's say, $100 million worth of product to uh, Italy, and Italy reports that it imports $300 million worth of product from Brazil, then somewhere Brazil's exports of $100 million got, got re-invoiced up to a level of 300 million, where we see these differences between what one country reports as its exports and another country reports as its imports, that suggests that, that confirms that those transactions have been re-invoiced. That's a big part of what we analyze is this difference in trade uh, data. Um, the combination of these two gives us a conservative estimate of how much uh, unrecorded money has passed out of a country. For Brazil, our analysis is that $400 billion uh, of unrecorded money uh, passed out of Brazil from 1960 to 2012. This is what the data shows. Of that, the greater part of it was through the misinvoicing of trade. Ninety-two percent of it was through the misinvoicing of trade. Um, only seven percent of it um, showed up in balance of payments uh, data. So, uh, what we're what we're saying is that uh, uh, trade accounts for the greater part of this. This can be the uh, the overpricing of imports that come into the country, it can be the underpricing of exports going out of the country. But trade certainly appears to be by far the biggest part of this phenomenon uh, for Brazil. This is similar to uh, most other uh, developing countries. Not all, but most developing countries indicate that the commercial sector is the biggest mover of uh, unrecorded money. Um, that gives you an idea of the, um, the, the component that arises from balance of payments data, uh, quite small compared to what arises through uh, the commercial uh, sector. Look how it's been growing. In the last three years, out of that $400 billion, $100 billion occurred in the last three years. This is a success significant uh, uh, growth in this uh, in, in the last three years. Um, part of the growth is related to the growth in cross-border trade. As cross-border trade grows, the opportunity to misinvoice that trade grows. So in part, this is a reflection of how much Brazil's trade with the world. Um, uh, has grown, but that's very substantial growth. Hundred billion dollars is uh, is not a small amount of money in three years. This is this is uh, an amount of money uh, 
um, that needs to be given very careful attention. Let me go a little bit further about how the misinvoicing of trade works. Let's suppose there is a, um, a, a Brazilian importer who wants to bring in cars from the United States. That Brazilian importer wants to uh, import um, a million dollars worth of cars from the United States. But the Brazilian importer decides that um, he or she wants to increase the amount of money in a foreign bank account um, that, that belongs personally to uh, the importer or belongs to the, the company of the importer. So the importer in Brazil, um, working with a, uh, let's say, a Switzerland entity, it could be Cayman Islands, it could be uh, uh, any one of, of 60 or more other uh, re-invoicing entities around the world. Uh, he works with that, and, and um, uh, the U.S. exporter is asked to send the invoice to um, the, the Swiss entity in this uh, example doesn't make any difference uh, to the American exporter where he sends the invoice. He'll send the invoice wherever it's asked to be sent. And that entity will pay the American uh, exporter um, uh, the $1 million. Then that entity, on instructions from Brazil, will write an invoice for $1.5 uh, uh, million. And that invoice goes from that entity to the Brazilian uh, importer, and the Brazilian importer will pay the one and a half million dollars uh, to the Switzerland uh, entity. By this process, we've generated five hundred million dollars, uh, five hundred thousand uh, dollars that has gone out of Brazil into a uh, foreign bank account. This can be done by unrelated parties. It can be done by related parties. It can be done in connection with uh, imports into Brazil. It can be done in connection with exports out of Brazil. Re-invoicing is the only part of trade misinvoicing that shows up in the data that we use. Let me explain that. There is another form of re-invoicing that doesn't show up in and that second form of re-invoicing is where the U.S. exporter and the Brazilian importer agree among themselves that the invoice will read $1.5 uh, uh, million. Dollars. And when the Brazilian pays the $1.5 uh, million, dollars, the U.S. Uh, uh, ex exporter will put that extra $500,000 uh, into the Brazilian importer's account. We call that same invoice faking. You can fake the price within the same invoice that is exchanged between buyer and seller. When you do that, that does not show up as a difference between uh, one country's trade data and another country's trade data. So none of that is included in what we, uh, uh, in what we analyze. There is a second uh, part um, of trade misinvoicing that is not included in our data. The data that is filed by governments with the IMF, which is incorporated within Direction of Trade Statistics, is data only on merchandise trade. It does not include data on services and intangibles such as licenses and royalties and insurance contracts and so forth. None of that is in direction of trade statistics that we utilize, and therefore that is not included. In fact, in recent years, the misinvoicing of services um, has exploded, uh, has become uh, very, very common. Licenses, royalties, and so forth, because there is no data compiled on it, uh, have become a favorite place to re-invoice transactions. So none of this shows up in our data. Uh, same invoice faking does not show up, um, and the misinvoicing of services does not show up uh, in our data. Um, there's another whole category of, uh, of 
movements of money that does not show up in our data, and that is cash, uh, cash movements across borders, particularly from, uh, from criminal activities. Drug trading doesn't show up, uh, arms trading, human trafficking, none of that uh, shows up in our data. And the point of telling you this is to make it clear that we regard our data as being extremely conservative. When we talk about a trillion dollars a year disappearing out of developing countries, we think that number is very conservative. When we talk about a hundred billion dollars disappearing out of Brazil in the last three years, we think that number is very conservative because of what is not included uh, in the numbers. But we prefer to utilize uh, official data in order to be credible. It, it doesn't make that much difference um, intellectually, whether the amount flowing out of Brazil uh, over the last three years is $100 billion or $200 billion, it's still a big enough number that warrants being addressed aggressively uh, by Brazil. So we prefer to be completely credible uh, in our data and use uh, information that is um, filed with governments. Let me stress, Brazil is not unique. Um, not by any stretch of the imagination. We're talking about a country um, uh, that is number seven on the list of exporters of unrecorded countries, uh, unrecorded money. Um, Brazil is number eight in GDP uh, uh, in the world. So uh, ahead of Brazil um, uh, are um, uh, uh, China, by far the biggest exporter of uh, unrecorded money, uh, Russia, uh, Mexico, uh, uh, and so on. Lots of, lots of countries are here. We're not talking about a phenomenon that is peculiar to Brazil. We're talking about a phenomenon that affects the whole of emerging markets and developing countries, and a phenomenon that needs to be addressed and curtailed. We'll talk about that more um, uh, later on. But this gives you a rough overview of what uh, um, you are, we are going to be addressing. Among the BRICS countries, Brazil is down there close to uh, uh, the bottom in annual illicit financial flows uh, going out. And um, if you look at um, um, illicit financial flows compared to GDP, again, there are countries where it's, it's a much greater problem than it is uh, for Brazil. Nevertheless, $100 billion is a lot of money. Uh, it warrants being uh, uh, addressed by Brazil, and we look forward to getting in deeper into what needs to be done about the problem. Thank you. That doesn't include same invoice taking, bulk cash smuggling. There's so much that's not captured in that that these are really conservative numbers is, is frightening. I mean, 1.5% of GDP is a lot. Um, and then that's the conservative figure. So uh, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Robel, if you want to share your remarks. Thank you. Good morning to all. Just say thanks to the Global Financial Integrity and to MINDS to organize this timely event. I think we can leave exactly that because then we comment uh, more about the BRICS countries. I'm, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Brazil, Russia, India, China, and uh, South Africa. Five member states of, of the BRICS. And um, it's not very pretty, but uh, we have to say that the five countries are amongst the 15 countries that export more illicit capital every year. Uh, and two of the members of the BRICS, China and uh, Russia, are the first and the second, which means that the countries of the BRICS are well represented in this uh, study, and the numbers really are staggering. As has been said this morning, these, these are not, even if they are not, they don't represent the full amount of what has been going out, they are 
staggering numbers. I will make some general comments about the countries of the BRICS, and I will concentrate a bit more about the red line, Russia, because Russia is a country that in the last couple of years has been growing a lot its uh, remittance of, of illicit capital. Uh, just some general data about the study that was done by Global Financial Integrity about developing countries. I think it were about 151 countries, isn't it? And uh, it's, it's interesting to think about in regions that uh, Asia accounts for more or less 40% of the total illicit flows from developing countries. Then we have um, the Western Hemisphere, which means Mexico and Brazil, because Mexico is the third after China and Russia. Mexico has been the third largest um, exporter of illicit flows. Then we have what is called developing Europe, which includes, of course, the, the former uh, communist countries of, of Europe and then other poorer countries of Europe. And there, of course, Russia is, the, is by far the first. Uh, Africa has its ups and downs, but it represented in 2001 about 7% of the total export. In relation to the percentage of GDP, developing countries in 2011 exported illicitly about 3.7% of their GDP, on average, of course. As I said, the top three exporters are China, with about a trillion dollars, Russia, with about $880 billion, and Mexico with about $460 billion. Um, as I said, six, six of the top 15 exporters of illicit flows are based in Asia, as I said. They are China, Malaysia, India, Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines. The two in Africa, Nigeria and South Africa, from Europe, Russia, Belarus, Poland, and Serbia, and from Latin America, Mexico and Brazil, and uh, one country represented from the MENAS country, which is the Middle East and North Africa, which is Iraq, for perhaps obvious reasons of economic conditions and political conditions in Iraq. Um, Russia is a, is a sort of special case because it, it grew a lot in the last years, the, the movement of uh, exporting illicit capital. And, and Russia be became from the fifth largest cumulative, uh, cumulative exporter of illicit capital to the second one in a few years then we can say there is something in, in Russia that is more developed in terms of exporting capital than in the other countries. Russia GDP growth was positively and significantly related to illicit outflows. Actually, we can say that for a lot of countries. When countries grow, usually there is a correlation with also growing the illicit exports or flow of capital, meaning that the country's growing is, is having, in theory, more money to invest, the government will have more money to invest in health, in education, in, in uh, transport, but more money is going out in these proceedings than um, part of the, the, the exercise or part of the effort of growing has been taken away in terms of uh, not paying taxes and other, and other government revenue. No. Then 
the cumulative, the cumulative illicit flow from the top 15 exporters of illicit capital that I was mentioning before amounts to over $4 trillion over the period, over the decade, uh, the period between 2002 and 2011. Four to trillion dollars, saying again, is a lot of money. Even if we are counting more than 10 years, it's a lot of money for developing countries, which as we know, they have a lot of, um, they need a lot of money to invest in all these economic and social issues. I mentioned China, China about a trillion dollars, Russia about 885, Mexico the third, and then India is the fifth, another member of the BRICS, India is the fifth with about 343 billion. Um, Brazil is the seventh with uh, almost 200 billion a year. Oh, sorry, for this period, 200 year for this 10 years cumulative. And South Africa, about 100 billion dollars. Then the, the, the last one was South Africa in terms of, of numbers is $100 billion, which is, I suppose, a lot of money for any African country, including South Africa, which is a relatively well-developed country. But in terms of China and Russia, we are talking about a lot of money. I think we can say the three common variables basically drove export misconceiving in the 55, in 55 developing countries over the period, over the, this period, 2002-2011. Two of these common variables are regulatory in nature. Export proceeds surrender the requirements and capital amount openness. And the third is the state of governance in the country concerned. I mentioned this before, that because the countries are growing, developing countries are growing, the illegal or illicit flow of capital has grown on average about 10% per year. 10% per year between 2002 and 2011. Of course, they are growing, maybe with the exception of China, they were growing more than GDP of, of the countries of uh, developing countries. And what is, is, what is lost, the one trillion dollars that I mentioned, is 10 times the amount of the countries receiving foreign aid, something that you have already mentioned, but is a, is a, it seems even a bit uh, a bit funny, so to speak, because it's, it's, it's ten times more than the countries that make a lot of effort and the, the donors make a lot of effort, and ten times more of this money which is given to aid, especially now. I imagine to Africa and Asia, um, 10 times more uh, 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 out of the country every year. I will concentrate a bit on Russia now and say some recommendations that were made to the case of Russia. Russia, the uh, illicit flow has been studied in Russia since 1994. And uh, in the period 1994-2001, the total has reached to, 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 to 2001, that's it, before the, the other study. In this study, the, the total has reached almost $800 billion or $44 billion per year. That was in the 19, 
end of 1990s, beginning of the year 2000. The recommendations that were made about what to do to stop or minimize this outflow from Russia, uh, the study strongly recommends that the Russian authorities should examine more carefully whether such illegal practices are undermining the government's fiscal policies. And the specific policy suggested uh, the domestic economy as well as policy actions that need to be taken on a bilateral or multilateral basis. They should maintain or make an effort to maintain price stability and tax structures that do not encourage evasion and strengthen different aspects of governance. In the case of Russia, there is also the Cyprus connection, the connection with the island of Cyprus that we know has been used by Russian millionaires and billionaires as a way to um, take money out of, of the country. The other staggering number is that the Russian underground economy is around 46% of GDP. 46%. Actually, in the case of Brazil, it's almost 40%. 39.1%. Then another policy solutions to Russia from um, completing what I just said is, is that, like in the case of Brazil, to, to boost Russian customs enforcement because the misconceiving of price is also used, export price are, are also used uh, in Russia. Monitor the transitions between Russia and tax, tax havens, which is very common information on any account opened by any citizen or company in the banks. The country should have this information. And try to influence the adoption of these measures uh, and, to enforce them, and to enforce them. Moving quickly to the case of Africa, South Africa, which is in this 15, is uh, the 11th with something around $100 billion. The international flow, in the case of Africa, perpetuates African economic dependence on other regions and donors and undermine Africa's capacity for the governments of Africa to implement development in an independent way. They also drain tax revenues in Africa and make scarce foreign exchange resources. Then African countries suffer from weakness of regulations, of course, and uh, a very um, open or a not very strong regulatory uh, standards, then all, all, of, all of these aspects should be improved in Africa to make uh, the flow of money less than it is. And, Nigeria is a case in point, not only South Africa. Nigeria is now the biggest economy in Africa. It, it passed South Africa this year. And uh, of course, as you were mentioning, the, the export of oil and gas is, is, the, is the main revenue for Nigeria. And one supposes that there is a lot of illicit flow of money from the business of oil and gas in Nigeria. 
three main forms of um, flow of financial flow to add from Africa. One is theft, really bribery, and other forms of corruption. Actually, it has been calculated in one of your papers that the amount of corruption, corruption per year in the whole world or in developing countries is about one trillion dollars. One trillion dollars is the sum of corruption in all over the world, particularly in developing countries. Then cr criminal activities including drugs, um, counterfeiting, uh, and, and, and things like that. And also in the third, you have tax evasion, laundering commercial transa transactions. Then these three, these three aspects are, are, are also part of other regions and other areas, but they are particularly relevant for the case of Africa. Actually, Africa has been contrary to what a lot of people expect or, or, or their knowledge. Africa has been growing significantly in the last 10 years or so. Uh, many countries of Africa, because of natural resources, of course, they, are, they have been maintaining a reasonable rate of growth. But as we see, the improving of the growth in the, in the GDP, it has a correlation with the amount of money that will go out. So probably Africa has been growing for the last 10 years, but has not been profiting from all this growth because most probably the illicit capital, the illicit flow has been improving. I was going to mention a recent study by the OECD and the recommendations, but I think it will be too long. I will just say something else about the BRICS, the BRICS countries. As far as I know, I might be wrong because I don't follow everything, but as far as I know, this theme has not been mentioned or has not been part of the now the sixth meeting of the heads of states of the BRIC countries, which took place a couple of months ago here in Brazil in Fortaleza. A lot of themes are being mentioned. As you probably know, BRICS is evolving as an organization, but is still looking for uh, things to do, let's say. And uh, this could be a, a, an interesting way of galvanizing many sectors of the countries to create a sort of um, um, a group or maybe it could be a, a emergency group, something like that, that will study this, this aspect of um, trade economics and um, lack of, of uh, taxes, and they could maybe try to create a common code of behavior, the country of BRICS, which could make them not the first, second, fourth, and seventh, and 11th amongst 150 countries, but they could become uh, more aware about this big problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robel. So um, we'll have a discussion here. I'll ask a few questions from the panelists, and then we'll open it up to Q&A in a few minutes so that everybody can participate in the discussion. Uh, I just uh, sort of wanted to start with, um, so the, the report that GFI did talks about 1.5% of GDP is being lost each year from illicit financial outflows. Uh, what does that mean to Brazil's economy? Brazil just 
as I you know, saw in the news the other day, just entered recession, um, what's, what does 1.5 percent of GDP mean? Um, I'll open it to Dr. Robel, do you want to start? Yeah. Low growth, probably 2014 will be close to zero growth. Mm -hmm. And 1.5% of the zero GDP is around what, 5 trillion, 10, 5 trillion real. It, it's, uh, it won't make the calculation now, but it's, it's quite a lot of money. It's quite a lot. Especially because um, there is a consensus now in the country that investment, government and private investment in education, health, transport, other social issues are crucial for this new development, sort of new cycle of this new development that has been formed in the last Let's consider if $100 billion disappears out of uh, a country, what would happen if that money stayed in uh, the country? Um, some people think that this is all about tax collection by the government. Well, tax collection is important, but if that $100 billion stayed in the country, uh, you know, maybe 20 or 30 percent of it will ultimately accrue as tax collection by the government, but it's the other uh, 70 or 80 percent of it that will remain in the economy to be invested, consumed, or saved, and will have a multiplier effect in the economy. That's the more important part uh, of, of uh, uh, this flow. Nevertheless, the amount that accrue to government can have a significant impact on health and education and infrastructure and stadiums and whatever else you want to build uh, uh, in Brazil. Uh, it can have a significant amount, it can produce a significant amount of money uh, 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 for development within uh, the country. Same is true of, of other emerging market and developing countries. Um, it's important to grasp that it is the amount of money that would remain in the economy uh, that has a multiplier effect that is important. I'm not suggesting that if $100 billion stayed in uh, Brazil, 100% of it would remain in Brazil. What might happen is that some companies that are using trade as a mechanism for sending money out of the country, uh, would then go ahead and earn their profits in Brazil and use dividends to send money out of the country. So uh, out of the 100 billion that uh, illicitly uh, disappears, uh, if it stayed in the country, some of it would go abroad. But we don't think uh, uh, very much. By far the greater part of it will have a multiplier effect in the economy and will accrue as taxes available to the government. Well, and if that is being paid back as dividends, though, then there is tax being paid on That's it, exactly and there is right. still some benefit from That's that. That's exactly right, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it's interesting to connect this to the BRICS, too, because for the past couple decades, um, these countries have all been have, you know, experiencing enormous growth. Um, but that slowed in recent years. You know, Brazil this year yeah. entering recession. Uh, Russia's on the verge of not recession. Growing. They're not growing. Um, India and China are experiencing the slowest growth in years on record. Um, is there, you know, what is there going to be an emerging effort to to sort of curtail these flows? Or? I think I think I think there is a lot of exaggeration about what is going on with the countries of the BRICS. So of course, that China is, is exceptional because China has grown over 10% for 30 years, which it's now growing 7.5%. Yeah. This is still a very <laughs> um, spectacular rate of growth. But the other four countries, each one have different problems. But it seems to me that is part of the process of growing fast for a number of years. I don't see, well, in the case of Brazil, that of course I am more, more familiar, 
-hmm. It was implemented in the last 10 years uh, as sort of a model based on the cons on consuming yeah. uh, and financing by federal and private banks that uh, it's reaching its limit, so to speak. Then the country needs to invest much more, to invest in infrastructure. Yeah, the infrastructure in Brazil is very poor. Then each of the countries have their own idiosyncrasy, so to speak. In the case of Russia, for instance, Russia is now mainly a great power in, in energy, oil and gas. Russia is now the, the, the the first producer of, of oil in the world, and the second exporter after Saudi Arabia. In gas, is uh, amongst the three countries, along with Iran and Qatar, which have 50% uh, of all the gas, reserves of gas, natural gas. That the country is very wealthy and very rich uh, in terms of natural resources, and probably this is why Russia is trying to maybe become a great power again, mm -hmm. as we are seeing in uh, the Ukraine, for instance. The case of India is, is similar. India was growing a lot in the, for 7 8% for a number of years. But of course, several domestic problems. Inflation got a bit out of control. Inflation reached almost 10%. There was a presidential election now. And the, the new president has a, another vision how to develop the country. In the case of South, South Africa, South Africa is still in a transition towards apartheid. Mm -hmm. And the great problem of South Africa is unemployment. So, so South Africa has a very high rate of unemployment, especially amongst the young. Mm -hmm. It's over 20, over 25% of unemployment in the world. Then it's, it's, it's part of the evolution of their economy. The, it will be impossible with the exception of China, for instance. Yeah, uh, to to grow for a long time uh, with this sort of of uh, rate. Let me add a point. Uh, also, when unrecorded money goes out of a country, some of it may round trip and come back into the country. How does this work? Unrecorded money goes out, goes, let's say, into a tax haven entity, into the Cayman Islands, um, into an entity that is incorporated in the Cayman Islands or elsewhere. Um, and then that money can come back into the country as foreign direct investment. In other words, it has gone out illicitly and it has come back uh, legally as foreign direct investment. I don't get the impression that that's affecting Brazil um, uh, very much because Brazil has some very uh, uh, aggressive policies uh, looking at tax havens uh, uh, entities. But you've talked about China. It certainly affects uh, China. It's estimated that perhaps 30 or 40 percent of the total amount of foreign direct investment that comes into China is in fact Chinese uh, illicit money that has gone out, incorporated itself as a foreign entity, and come back in uh, as FDI. Um, you might be surprised to, to know uh, who's the second biggest investor in China. Hong Kong is the biggest investor in mainland China. The second biggest investor in mainland China is the British Virgin Islands. That's, that's all Chinese money that has gone into uh, BVI, incorporated itself as a foreign entity, and come back into China um, as foreign direct uh, uh, investment. Of course, recognize when it comes back in as FDI, it is intending to go out again in the form of dividends or interest uh, paid on loan capital or principal payments on loan capital or, or what have you. But it has acquired a foreign nationality which allows it to conduct its business in a somewhat different fashion than if it were a domestic uh, entity. They receive tax benefits too for foreign direct investment. And and like many that. countries give tax benefits for FDI, and in many cases, these are, uh, in the case of China, um, uh, these are Chinese that are enjoying those tax benefits. Um, this <coughs> report, I guess these findings bring up 
looking at some of the other countries, Russia with its natural resources, South Africa with its natural resources, is there a connection to the resource curse between illicit financial flows and natural resources? Um, I, I think that's a fair statement. Um, we've done two reports on, on uh, Africa, and certainly it is the resource exporting countries in Africa that are the main movers of illicit money going out of, uh, of that continent. Um, I must admit, I don't, I don't, I don't altogether understand why resource exporting countries are so much bigger in this phenomenon uh, than other countries. Uh, but let me give you uh, 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 perhaps a few thoughts uh, on that. Um, let's take a country like Zambia. Zambia exports copper. Um, the biggest copper mine in Zambia is owned by Glencore, uh, established in Switzerland. Glencore buys from its own entities abroad. That is to say, everything it imports in terms of equipment and materials to do its copper mining is invoiced by its own buying company in Europe. And then Glencore, then Glencore sells to itself the copper that it mines uh, uh, in Zambia. If you control the price of what you import and the price of what you export, you can operate forever without showing a profit uh, in Zambia. I've seen it all over the world in the case of many, many, many uh, uh, companies going all the way back to uh, uh, the first person that I talked to when I got to Africa, and he says, I'm not trying to make a profit. Um, because resource uh, business in many developing countries has such a significant uh, component of multinational companies operating uh, uh, in those uh, countries, I think that's a big part of the explanation of why um, resource exporting countries are in, in fact sending so much of their money abroad. It's because there are a lot of uh, multinational corporations that are um, 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 doing the price manipulations that allow them to uh, minimize profits uh, in, those, uh, uh, in those entities. A lot of joint ventures around the world between governments and foreign corporations are operating at a break-even point or a very low profit margin. Um, you shouldn't think for a moment that the multinational corporation that is invested in that entity is operating at a break-even point. On the contrary, the multinational can make money on what it is supplying to uh, the, uh, the, the entity, whether it's an oil company or a mining company. It can make money on, on the equipment and material that is being supplied there. Um, I think this is what's going on. We would, we would frankly like to study this question uh, a great deal more. And there is data that would enable us to do that. We're reasonably sure that we can um, produce the data that will show that, for example, a, a compressor that is used in the oil industry is exported from the United States to Canada at one price and exported from the United States, Nigeria, or Angola, or Brazil, or elsewhere at a quite different uh, price, at a higher price. Um, but that's a, that's a piece of work that we haven't done yet, but we would very much like to do uh, uh, that kind of work. Of course. Can I, yeah, can I raise a, a point about this issue? It's, it's a simple point, but perhaps because the countries with more natural resources export natural resources, they will become richer. And there is a connection between be becoming richer and more inflows, illicit flows, uh, going out of the country. Perhaps this connection should be considered as well. It's, uh, of course, yeah. much simpler than the role of the multinationals and the government. Yeah. But it's just a point that uh, came to my mind that uh, we, we talk about it many times. Yeah. So we, we're talking about natural resources. It's sort of staring us in the face right now is Petrobras. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, the first five pages of O Globo today I opened up as Petrobras scandal. Yeah. You're Brazilian. Is there, is there, you know, a connection between natural resources in other countries, natural resources in this country, and illicit flows? No, I, I think I think the case of Petrobras, which has been going on for quite some time, it's um, I have to say it's a form of of internal corruption that is, has been going on. Uh, it's the biggest company in Brazil. It's the biggest company in Latin America. Mm -hmm. It's the proud of of Brazilians, but unfortunately, a lot of uh, bad decisions were made. In Petrobras in the last years, and uh, and now there is is quite clear that uh, some form of corruption involving not only the company but also state governors, senators, members of Congress, which is very sad and very dangerous. Less than one month before presidential elections, which will happen in Brazil on the fifth of October. But differently from that, the, the role of Petrobras as an oil company, especially an explorer of, of oil, particularly in the, what we call the pre-salt pre -salt area, which is a very deep area in the bay uh, outside the states of Rio and Sao Paulo, it, it has been explored in the last a couple of years and is producing significantly mm -hmm. more than half of Brazilian oil, which is about two million barrels a day. More than half has been produced by these camps or these and it seems that the reserves are very big. Then there are so to speak two two Petrobras in parallel. One which continues to to work as a major oil company. And the other, which is very unfortunate, that was somehow dominated by a sort of a gang for, for some time. Now, another issue that, that the, this Brazil report brings up, and some of the other reports I know explored by GFI have, have, have found connections to with the, the models, are inequality. <laughs> and illicit flows. Yeah. In India, there was a connection. In this report, there's a connection. Would you care to good touch point. on? No, I think, I, think, I think it's a good point. I think I forget to mention that. I think your, in, your, in your study, it's clear that another, another element which should be taken into consideration is, is um, in, in, inequality in, in, in a country. Uh, as much unequal a country is, more the possibility that more money will come out of it illicitly. And of course, we are talking about countries, the five countries of the BRICS, for instance. All of them, they have uh, high inequality. China is growing inequality in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Russia as well. India, we know. In South Africa, we know. The case of Brazil is that the, in the last 10, 12 years, or in the last 15, 20 years, inequality has <coughs> gone down. It is still very high, but uh, is, uh, there was some concerted social policies to, to try to bridge the gap, which was very big. And, uh, it is it's becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. But uh, a lot of things still, still have to be done. We study global inequality in, in GFI. All of our data on inequality is short of the mark, is less than the inequality uh, realistically. And the reason for that is because none of our data includes the earnings on assets that have been taken abroad. None of our data um, uh, picks up for Brazil or other developing emerging market countries. Our data does not pick up how much people are earning on those assets that they have taken permanently uh, uh, abroad. If we were able to include the earnings on those assets that have been taken abroad, 
into our inequality calculations, we would see that inequality is much wider uh, than it appears uh, uh, in the data. There is a global consensus that extreme poverty um, needs to be addressed. And this is certainly um, um, a prevailing theme in the current Millennium Development Goals and in the Sustainable Development Goals, which will follow over the next 15 years. There's a consensus that we've got to wipe out extreme poverty. There is no similar consensus on the question of inequality. We don't know what to do uh, with this. And part of the reason is because we don't know what level of inequality uh, is acceptable and, and what level is not uh, acceptable. I think inequality is a huge problem going forward, but we don't know what to do with it. In uh, GFI held a conference at the Brookings Institution this past April in which we, for the first time, linked the subject of illicit financial flows and global inequality together, and had a, a powerhouse group of people addressing this issue. It was all extremely interesting, but we did not come out of there with any uh, uh, really good ideas as to what to do about the problem of inequality. All right, well, we've got about 25 minutes left on the panel, so I want to make sure that we can open it up for questions from the audience. So. Uh, Mateusz and uh, has some microphones in the back. So if anybody has any questions, uh, if you could raise your hand and they'll come find you with a uh, wireless mic. So up here, we've got a couple. Please introduce yourself and uh, your name, where you're from as well, before asking your question. Thank you. Um, I'll keep the English. Uh, I. Something that came to my mind, I haven't seen all the studies, but uh, is there any correlation? Have you tested the correlation between the international list of flows and any other variable like education in a country? Have you checked if a country that has higher index of international financial flows uh, has something to explain it besides good governance and the way the, the institutions are organized? Thank you. I'm sorry, Adriana, UK Trade and Investment. Thank you for that question, Adriana. I, uh, it's a fascinating question. Um, and I'm going to give you a, a, a bit of a long answer to it. Um, it took us about four or five years to get the community of economic development scholars to accept what we were talking about in terms of illicit financial flows. But they finally did. And then the question turned to, okay, we, we recognize your methodology and your numbers and so forth. What does that mean in terms of health and education and so forth in a country? Can you relate that directly to what it means, um, um, what could be done in those countries if the money stayed within those countries? We're turning our attention to that question right now and spending more time uh, trying to answer that. Indeed, we are giving consideration to compiling indexes of illicit financial flows uh, compared to education expenditures, compared to social expenditures altogether, compared to uh, uh, imports and exports, compared to the number of people who are living uh, in the lowest 10% of the economy and so forth. We're thinking about that, but it's, it's, a, it, it's not easy. It's a complicated uh, subject matter, and if we do it, we want to do it right. But you're absolutely on the mark. That's the next step in what we are trying to do. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to take a, a rule from, from that, of course, but the case of China, for instance. China is number one of countries, but education in China seems to be very good, at least when you compare these texts in, in, in secondary education, primary education, Asians usually are first and second and third in the case of China. Then it's, it's a complication of this correlation because, because China, as I said, is, is, is about a trillion, a trillion dollars of, of, of flows and uh, the education of the country is very good. All right. Uh, 
you. Another question up here. Uh, Paulo from BNBS. Uh, first point, uh, can you separate which kind of uh, thing that it's money from Brazil or things like, uh, for example, um, Starbucks doing the Nigerian trick that you learned when you arrived there, uh, having no profits in UK because the coffee comes from Switzerland. <clears throat> so we, we can uh, see that there's two points. Maybe some of this is money that is being taken from the third world. Maybe some is money that's being taken from uh, first world. Uh, forms of ta tax management, tax evasion, stuff like this. So how do you separate this? Second point, uh, in this, uh, which kind of uh, goods are used as uh, the response for this? For example, if this is done, uh, Brazil, when we, ex we, export, we export soy soybeans, they are exported uh, not by the Brazilian producers, but they are exported by Cargill, Dreyfus, Bungi, and some uh, companies like Lencor. So how much of this is evasion by the, the Brazilian uh, producers or the untaxed uh, gains of the international traders. So uh, I think that's the, are two points that uh, I, I would love to see this uh, data open by by products. I think that question of the um, the the um, uh, commodity exporting countries would be explained with this. Uh, and uh, further point. Uh, o Globo talking about this is like Fox News discussing Obamacare. So you must take with a very big grain of salt the way that is dealing. We have an election now, and this the this is our taking example in the United States. This is our Benghazi. Okay. So understand this. Understand that. There are sides in the press, and uh, it's not New York Times. All right. We don't analyze um, unrecorded flows out of the richer countries because the same methodologies that we use for the developing countries don't necessarily work in the richer countries. Take the United States as an example. Uh, the United States dollar is a global currency, and it is very difficult uh, uh, to do the kind of analysis that we do with a country where the currency is, is a global currency in trade. I wish we could. Uh, there have been some analyses. Uh, take the Cayman Islands. The Cayman Islands, um, the last time I looked at the figures, had $1.7 trillion in deposits of which about 800 billion was from US uh, uh, depositors. But that's a stock analysis rather than a flow analysis. So it, it's, it's pretty difficult to do what we do uh, concerning the developing countries. Now you ask what kinds of um, um, uh, products lend themselves to this sort of misinvoicing. Um, despite the fact that I use copper out of Zambia as an example, there is a world market price for copper, um, and we can see that Zambia is losing about uh, $500 million a year in that world market price being underpriced in copper going out of Zambia. Having said that, Commodities such as rice and wheat and copper and uh, uh, oil and so forth tend to have a world market price, and you can compare um, the, uh, the prices to those world market norms, 
and typically the pricing will not vary by more than five or six or seven percent or something like that. World, market, world commodities tend to have a price that you can look at and, and uh, compare to fairly, uh, fairly clearly. Where mispricing, uh, misinvoicing can amount to 500% or 1,000% is in specialized machinery uh, or other kinds of specialized uh, uh, pharmaceuticals or software or that sort of thing. You can get enormous variations uh, in prices there and, they, and you, can't, uh, you can't tell it. The reason that trade misinvoicing is the most popular mechanism for sending money uh, unrecorded across borders is because it's difficult to see what's going on. Um, an individual managing director in a company, and I have seen this in the developing world, an individual managing director in a company can misprice what he's buying or selling, and even his accountant uh, uh, cannot tell it. Uh, because uh, he's doing it by maybe a, a fairly modest percentage uh, accumulating money abroad, and, and, and even his accountant uh, cannot tell it. It only takes two people to misprice the transaction, the buyer and the seller. And it doesn't matter whether they're dealing at arm's length with each other or whether it's within a multinational corporation. It only takes two people, buyer and seller, to agree to misinvoice the transaction and that transaction is misinvoiced and money goes abroad. Broadly speaking, the more specialized the, the item being dealt with, the, um, uh, the easier it is to misprice by larger percentages. One of, the, um, one of the popular things that we've heard about recently is actually it's wine. Um, there's been a whole bunch of media about, about the value of wine because a bottle of wine can be $5, a bottle of wine can be $5,000. And no customs officer is going to be able to tell the, the difference unless they're an expert in, in the field. So uh, that you know, is a perfect example of an easy thing to misinvoice, whereas, like you said, copper, oil, world market price is much harder. Uh, Dr. Robles, do you want to add anything? No. Uh, do we have another question right up here in the front? Uh, Leonardo Pache from the Brazilian Center for International Relations. Something struck my attention, and perhaps Raymond somehow started to answer my question, is where are the developed countries in the IAF, IFF map, in the rankings? Because, of course, you are talking about the BRICS. It's a BRICS panel, so it makes sense talking about developing world, but hardly you and, and Paulo talked about developed countries. Where are they? And somehow when Paulo made the correlation between having more money from developing countries, make more room to illicit flows. So when I, I get thinking about Italy, Spain, uh, UK, France, even Australia perhaps, that they have a different currency. You mentioned the problem of, with dollar. So those guys have fairly big economies. So there is not room to do that. And they also have a lot of multinationals that make sense moving the, that money uh, illicitly. So where are, the, where are the developing countries in the IFF map? Thank you. Um, certainly the richer countries are participants uh, uh, in this. Um, I, again, it's, it's more difficult to produce the data on it, but let's give you a few examples. Uh, Greece um, has been sending money out of Greece for uh, a long time, and it in part accounts for the problems that Greece, uh, uh, had, the economic problems they've had of late. Portugal was sending a, a lot of money out. Um, an awful lot of European money has been uh, over decades going into uh, uh, Switzerland. The Germans have uh, been up in arms uh, about German money in Switzerland, uh, other countries as well. But that data is, is, is more difficult. It's very interesting to us that we can do a better job, that the sources of data are better for money going out of the developing world into the richer world than it is on interchanges within the richer world. The data is better on, on uh, what's coming out of the developing world. We'd like to change that reality, but it's, uh, uh, it's very difficult uh, to do. The Bank for International Settlements uh, in Switzerland, for example, 
compiles data on cross-border deposits, um, but they do it by groups of countries and they won't break it down into the individual countries. So it's very difficult for us to see um, how much French money is deposited into other European uh, countries. Uh, we'd like to get the, the BIS to break that data down uh, by each exporting country and each importing country. Uh, but, uh, but, but that's not the way that the BIS compiles the data. And indeed, um, it is the central banks that cooperate with BIS who say, we will give you this data, but you don't, uh, you don't publicize it. You can, compile, uh, you can compile the total amount of Brazilian money that is in other countries, but you cannot compile how much of the Brazilian money is in the UK or France or Singapore or uh, uh, where have you. We'd like to, to break that barrier and get the BIS to uh, give us disaggregated data. But uh, that's not where the thinking of the West is at the moment. We'd like to push that uh, if we could. It's a very good point. You know, and, uh, I have thought about it myself because you mentioned Italy. Italy, Italy probably has a um, subterranean informal economy, which is probably one third of, of GDP, yeah, as I was told. <laughs> then, uh, well, I mentioned Cyprus. Yes. Cyprus is a member of OECD now. It's a member of the EU. It's a member of the OECD. And Cyprus is, is deeply involved, of course, with uh, the export of Russian money. Um, then it's a good idea to do it, to try to do it. I understand why you, you can do it. You can't do it, but it's a good idea. What these countries are doing is it's not precisely the same, but Italy and the UK are, are two countries that I know that they are including in their calculus of, of national account, of GDP, um, illegal ac activities like prostitution, drug trafficking, they estimate how prostitution and drug trafficking and other illegal activities uh, cost every year. And they are including it in, the, in their national accounts, in the GDP, which will probably make the GDP of both Italy and, and the UK go up <laughs> one, one or two percent. Um, all right. I think um, we'll take, try and take two or three at a time, or, or Leonardo, do you have, you have questions? Yeah, uh, Leonardo Bolamaki at the State University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, thanks, thank you very much, Raymond, for another great report. Uh, I would like to ask for your reaction to something that occurred to me when you said, I think you mentioned more than once, at least once, if the money had stayed, right, the problem, the whole problem hidden resource for development, if the money has stayed. And then, well, of course, we could have had more development, another percent of GDP growth. But then I thought a little bit more about that same phrase when you're doing your, your, your presentation. And well, if the money stays, I would suggest it is a potential resource for development. It's not necessarily a real one, right? Because if it stays, it's liquidity. It's not necessarily productive consumption. It's not gonna. It's not necessarily be used to as a consumption as consumption, or even maybe more difficult. Uh, for productive investment. So in a way, there is a hidden assumption that if the money stays, it will be invested or it will be consumed. And the other not so good alternative to that is that it could stay and as just liquidity, it could be there to inflate a financial bubble. This is one sort of question in terms of if, if you're 
thinking also about this uh, global financial integrity. And the other one it refers to correlation versus causation, which is always a, a very messy problem, right, for, for all of us. For example, China. Uh, China is obviously big on illicit capital flows, but it's also very big on development. So in that sense, it does both. It gets a lot of money out, most of it illicit, and is the, the champion of uh, growth rates and has been for the last three decades. So how do you react to that? Thanks. Um, as you've implied, you can do three things with the money that stays in the country. You can invest it, you can consume it, or you can save it. If it's saved, it's probably in a bank account and can be used as uh, um, uh, the basis for loans that are made for other people's uh, uh, investment or consumption. But those are the three things that you can uh, you can do with it. Invest it. Cons hmm? Yeah. I, I agree, but it uh, if it you know if it stays in the economy, it's going to have some multiplier effect. I've run into this kind of question frequently in um, uh, in other countries who say, well, you know, does it do us any good um, if it's just spent on mansions or on Johnny Walker Black Label or uh, Mercedes-Benz cars or what have you, and my answer is I'd rather have it stay in the country than go out of the country. Even if it's spent on luxury goods, I would prefer that it uh, uh, stayed in the country than, uh, than goes out. This gets back to the complications of addressing inequality, and we don't have an answer as to how you, uh, uh, how you address inequality, but the beginning point is I'd like Brazil to keep its money. I'd like other countries to keep their money rather than having it uh, uh, flow abroad. There was another part of your question, Leonardo. China. Uh, China is, uh, is, uh, is incredible. Um, China is sending more illicit money abroad than any other country. China is also sending more legal money abroad than any other country. It, uh, it's tops in both of the categories. It's tops in what it invests in foreign uh, uh, securities, and it's tops in what it uh, illegally gets out um, uh, abroad. Um, China's growth rate would have been faster than is shown in the data if the money had stayed uh, in the country. So China is indeed has has had exceptional uh, growth, and um, I'm not sure that we are um, yet quite certain what the future is going to be in that growth, whether it's going to continue as fast as it has um, in the past or what. It is an exception to almost everything uh, uh, that we look at, except that it is the biggest exporter of uh, illicit capital. It has exported an enormous amount of illicit capital. It has at the same time grown internally uh, substantially. Yeah, I mean, uh, one trillion sounds, and it is a lot of money. But you have to take into consideration the size of the economy of, of China. <clears throat> if, if I'm not mistaken, China now has an economy of about $9 trillion, reaching $10 trillion. And then, and then it's, it's about 10% of, of its, uh, it, it's a lot. But when you look at one trillion, you think that. OK, uh, what I, maybe I did not make myself clear. What I'm really questioning is the assumption that if the money stays, it will have a multiplier. Raymond said that. Because if you buy Mercedes or black label, et cetera, of course it will, because it's consumption. What if this one trillion goes for options in the ex ex stock exchange? It's not, it's not necessarily uh, have any sort of multiplier. 
it can inflate a bubble. That's my, my point. So it's not obvious or guaranteed that if the money stays, it will have a Keynesian type of multiplier. That's my point. Thanks. Maybe not a Keynesian type of effect, but it will have a multiplier effect, even if the multiplier is inflationary. Agreed. Agreed. I'm not making a judgment on the quality of the multiplier. I'm simply saying it will multi it will have a multiplier effect. All right. Um, I think it's unpredictable. <laughs> yes. It's unpredictable. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Not assume. It will, it will have. Yeah. Sort of, it, it will feed development. I think the best answer. It depends on a lot of other things which are domestic including the way the financial system functions domestically. It's true, but totally unpredictable. So we're getting close to um, lunchtime, so we'll just try and have one more question. Uh, I would like to know about the correlation between political stability and economic fragility between the countries and the growth of illicit financial flows. Political stability. Political stability, instability with yes. economic fragility yeah. related to the flows, related yeah. to the flows. You are asking if, if there is, I suppose you are asking if the political instability goes up, yeah. the economic fragility will go up again, yes. and what will happen with the flow? Yeah. <laughs> well, we noticed that the country, Russia and India, have uh, higher levels than the other countries, Brazil and uh, um, the China. China so yeah, Russia, Russia, particularly Russia, which is. Yeah. Uh, I think it's very difficult to, to define because one supposes that if there is political instability, you are probably referring to any sort of uh, coup d'etat or, or, or any sort of uh, election which the result was not accepted by one of the candidates, this, this sort of thing. It's, uh, it, tends, it tends to, to have some consequences for the, the economy, is right. Uh, but if the flows will go up or down, I, I suppose, from the rich, from the rich part of the country, they will probably go up, <laughs> because if there is political instability, the people with more wealth will be more scared about it. Then they will try somehow to send it the individuals and the economies and, and sorry and the companies which have more to to lose if there is if the political instability continues. They will try to to send money out, of it, legal or illegal, yeah. and uh, then you can say that this correlation will lead to the increase of international financial flows. But uh, it, the, uh, there is a lot of ifs, a lot of speculation that uh, what can happen. In that. But I, I would just say that these these five countries, these five members of the BRICS. Not all five are democracies, as we know. But the all five have a relative, relative political instability for the last 20 years, more or less. Even if what Russia is doing now in, in Europe with the Ukraine <laughs> might create some sort of political instability in the region, but so far, these countries are politically stable. And actually, it was one of the reasons why. This but, but Russia is in war with Ukraine, and India, there is not a. No, like, India has a new president, which seems OK. Yeah, the, Russia is not officially in war <laughs> with Ukraine, it's, it's, uh, it's unofficial. War, then we have to wait and see. But certainly, it seems it seems to me that what what is happening there is that President Putin is 
trying to slowly to make Russia a big power, a big power again in the international system. How it will end, no, nobody knows. But, but I think just to complete what you, you asked, I think it's probable that the case, the, the international flow will go up because of the risk and the fear of political instability. When it comes to the fragility of nations, I would refer you to the Fragile States Index, uh, which is published annually in Foreign Policy Magazine, uh, the work of um, uh, the Fund for Peace in Washington. And uh, I have to confess, my wife was the creator of the Failed State Index uh, and uh, was the president of the Fund for Peace for many years. But uh, even as she has retired, the publication of the index uh, 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 continues. I believe we've seen in some of the studies that we've done, along with political crises, um, or uh, as well as with different macroeconomic crises, there, there are spikes in outflows, both legal and illicit. Is that not the case, Brandon? Yeah, we've got a chart to that effect concerning Brazil in this report, yeah. identifying uh, certain uh, uh, points at which um, uh, illicit outflows uh, reacted to political and economic events in Brazil. All right. Um, so, I. All right. So this will be the last question. Then here we go. We'll we'll do one more, and this will be the last question. Uh, I will speak in Portuguese. <laughs> All right. She has a. Okay. É, meu nome é Luiz Bicalho, eu sou da Receita Federal aqui do Brasil e do Instituto de Justiça Fiscal. E uma questão que nos interessa é particularmente a relação existente entre os fluxos ilícitos e os fluxos lícitos. Eu vi muito aqui a relação entre os fluxos ilícitos e o, o produto interno bruto. Mas quanto é o percentual de fluxos ilícitos sobre os fluxos, digamos, lícitos dentro de um país como o Brasil ou outros países? So I don't think either Raymond or I got that. No, I didn't. I had I can someone say, working yeah, on it. He's asking for the comparison between illicit and licit funds, flows out of the country. Uh, because we talked much more about illicit funds, but we didn't talk about licit funds, only mentioned about this illicit funds, licit funds. And what is the proportion in any country, could be Brazil, of licit and illicit flows from these $40 billion. Um, fair question. Yes, there is legal money that flows out of the country. And um, um, you know, I have no objection to that whatsoever. The difference between the licit and the illicit component is quite straightforward. The legal component of money that goes abroad stays on the books of whoever is uh, uh, exporting it, whether it's a company or an individual, you're still recording that you own that asset. The illicit component that goes abroad is intended to disappear from uh, the records within uh, the country. It's a quite straightforward difference uh, uh, between the two. We look at both. We look at uh, what we call broad capital flight, which is uh, inclusive of the legal component that goes abroad, and we look at the illicit component of that that uh, goes abroad. Uh, but our focus, our recommendations are focused on how you curtail the, uh, uh, the illicit part of that. Is that a satisfactory answer to your question? Do you have any percentage for yeah. that? Have any? 68%. Do you have any percentage for Brazil? 68% of broad capital flight, which is what a combination of licit and illicit, was yeah. composed of illicit 
um, financial flows. So 68% of the broad capital flight was illicit. The remaining 32% would have been licit. Um, and it was found that illicit flows drove broad capital flight, which when you when you start, start growing, to growing illicit, growing licit, it grow, the illicit goes, yeah. uh, goes up as well. Yep. So uh, that's about a uh, little afternoon now. So um, hopefully you guys are hungry because we are going to be breaking for lunch. There is a last uh, Give it back to. Uh, uh, do, é we have time? do we have time? Yeah. Okay. I guess we'll have one more. Okay. Question. Obrigado. Vou falar em português também, tá? É, o que se percebe é, bom, eu estou convencido de que do que se falou que o fluxo ilícito ele não é bom para a humanidade. É, o fluxo lícito é um fluxo que teria controle dos países, dos órgãos e é, chegando-se à conclusão que o fluxo ilícito não é bom para a humanidade, não é bom para as sociedades, para as populações, é, a gente percebe que o mecanismo em que é, para que se haja essa evasão da divisa, para que se haja essa evasão dos tributos, é, ele é o, através do comércio internacional, pelo que está se, pelo que está se mostrando aqui. O comércio internacional está sendo utilizado largamente ou entre companhias diferentes ou entre a mesma companhia para que esse fluxo ilícito ocorra é, cada vez é, de forma mais significativa, com mais dinheiro. É, então, a gente percebe que assim, é, a ousadia aumentou, porque está muito fácil de perceber. É, ou é entre grandes empresas diferentes, ou é entre a mesma empresa, e todas elas podem ser fiscalizadas pelos seus países. E sempre, ou quase sempre, utilizando um terceiro país que se presta a esse papel. Então, assim... É, Voltando ao início do que eu estava falando, é, a humanidade está perdendo, as sociedades estão realmente é, é, tendo prejuízo, tendo, é, as pessoas estão deixando de ter escola, estão deixando de ter é, as suas necessidades básicas atendidas, em função de uma, é, de uma realização de, de lucro ilícito através de, de fluxos em que você tem grandes companhias que têm fachadas de legalidade, fachadas de, é, de, de que são é, é, geridas por pessoas íntegras, por interesses íntegros, e países que defendem, que se prestam a esse tipo de atividade, que também se dizem países desenvolvidos, com grande, é, grande desenvolvimento da sua própria sociedade, mas, se a gente botar isso é, é, às claras, a gente percebe que é, há uma grande, é, um grande mal para a humanidade. Isso poderia ser considerado, talvez, um crime contra a humanidade. Então, se a gente consegue escancarar o que está acontecendo, a gente pode... Porque o meu, qual é a minha questão que eu coloco para vocês? Como que a gente vai resolver isso? Eu acho que, é através da discussão, descobrindo o que está acontecendo e escancarando, mostrando, mostrando mal, associando o mal que se faz para a humanidade com, essa, é, com esses objetivos que são realmente mesquinhos, né? que são objetivos é, de lucro, de, enfim, de fuga. De... Porque, é, não, me convence, não me convence qualquer tentativa de explicação ou de, ou de é, associação de fluxos ilícitos a coisas positivas que se faz para a humanidade. Mesmo que se tenha... É, ah, é, o, se o dinheiro ficar no país, você pode gastar ele com é, bens de luxo, ele vai estar sob controle. É um dinheiro que vai estar sob controle. Enfim, é, eu queria entender essa questão política, como que se vai... É, como que, se, como que a gente pode fazer é, com que a humanidade ou, ou que os grandes ou que as organizações, que os países percebam é, que a, a gravidade do que está acontecendo, né? Porque isso tem um impacto muito grande na vida das pessoas no mundo inteiro. Yes, uh, I'll try to summarize. Can I try to summarize what he said? Oh, sure. Yeah. 
Uh, no, he's just asking whether how is it possible to to uh, curtail this illicit investment, and especially the political question of how to turn it more public and force it to society as a whole to understand that it's a question, a crime against society, and ag against society, against humanity. It's more a question of uh, the political question and how to turn it more public and more, well, society to know it better. It's more or less. Fortunately, we're going to have a panel uh, about um, how to curtail these illicit flows this afternoon. Um, so we'll have an hour and a half to talk about that in depth. Um, I don't know if there's anything briefly I will, I will say I will say very briefly for um, initiatives like these and others one hopes is going to the right way but it's it's a process it's a process it takes time it's a process is is you have to convince public opinion you have to convince the government but everything in the financial sector particularly is very difficult to change we just had the recession, a big recession from 2008 to 2011, 12. And one of the, there was, there was a, a consensus that one activity that had to be done was to change a lot the financial system in the developed countries for to not allow what happened to happen again. Was it changed? Was the the financial system of, of the developed countries in New York or London or, or changed substantially. There was, there was some changes, of course, but not substantially. Then it's, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to change. It's a very important and powerful industry, finance. Even more and more and more. Then the public and the, the society has, has to be patient in the sense as I said, trying to convince public opinion and try to convince governments. It's good that we, we have someone from Receita Federal here who can uh, pass the message up in Brazil that these things are happening in this staggering amount. All right, well, thank you all very much. Um, Christy, I'll, I'll bring you back up here to close things out. First, uh, thank our great panel for getting us started this morning.